Let's get into some examples of single resource decisions, as well as some factors to consider when making these choices. Let's start with a simple short-term spend example. We'll just pick a product that is gonna be available at two different locations. And let's assume both locations are a similar distance from where I am here with similar access inside and out. So the buying experience is going to be basically the same in both cases. I'll put my bitterness aside that I ripped off my gimmick here and use this for a product. So with these two options, it's a very simple decision that option one is the lower cost and therefore the better choice over option two, all else being equal. I should also note that I'm an engineer, which means I love Excel. It is perfect for doing these kind of scenarios, lays it out easy, does the math for us, and allows us to see which option is better than the other for us. We enter the price, we have our two outcomes, and we easily choose option one as the one that conserves our resources in this spend case. It's also a short-term decision because we immediately saw the results of our actions by saving money in buying from one source versus the other. What happens if we add a longer term component before we see results and we do an investment where we're getting a payback instead of us spending money? I don't wanna to get too deep into finance at this point, but let's take a CD or certificate of deposit. It is a savings account available at most banks. What it allows you to do is invest some money and you can't touch it for some period of time, six months, 12 months, whatever it is. At that time, it'll be worth more because it's accrued interest in that period. So you'll get back more money than what you put in. So you spend $1,000 on day one that you can't touch for some period of time. That means you may have $1,000 less today, but we're talking about a long-term view. However, in the long term, that $1,000 is going to be worth $1,000 plus whatever interest it earned. So based on current rates today, let's just say our $1,000 CD is going to be invested for 12 months, and in that 12 months, it's going to gain 4% interest. Option one is more the stay or passive approach where you're not really deciding to change anything. Your $1,000, you're leaving in a no interest checking account, or you're putting in coffee cans and burying in the backyard like Cousin Eddie, and it's going to be worth the exact same amount in a year. Option two results in the $1,000 plus the 4%, which in this case is $40 in interest, meaning at the end of the year, you have $1,040 now. So option two is the more objective choice because it results in an increase in our resources a year from now. So when we say long-term, how long do we mean? How long is long-term? Is there a limit on it? Most business and tax practices accept a three-year or even a five-year depreciation schedule. In other words, you're looking for a payoff on some investment in three years. So what does that mean in simple terms for us as individuals and not giant corporations? Three years is still a good payoff estimate or target. The reason for that is because it's very difficult for any of us to predict the future more than three years in advance. Also, it's very inefficient to wonder or to ponder. If every time we come to a decision, we have to think about, wow, should this be a two year or a four year or how should we look at this? That takes time and takes away from the whole point of what we're trying to do here. Now in life, we are going to get faced with decisions such as saving for retirement or buying a house that are well past the three year mark. And that's fine and we'll address those when we come to them. But for right now, the more we can just say, look, three years is our, our limit for a long-term payoff. We're gonna stick to that that makes our decision-making process easier, more effective, more efficient to make good choices for the future. Let's just say a gym membership costs $10 a month for easy math. That $10 a month for 12 months makes $120 for a year. So that's option one. Now, if they offered an annual membership that you paid up front for $100, and we put that in here as line two, that saves us $20 in cost over that year of time. So the annual membership now becomes a better option than paying month to month. If they offered a three-year membership for say $250, and that's option three, that's even better. So again, we're prepaying, which means out of the gate, it's taking more cash out of our pocket 
but in the long term of even this three years, it still is the better picture. So that option three, the three-year membership, would put us in the best place three years from now, and that makes that the objective choice based on a long-term decision. Another factor to consider is probability. So let's say that same gym also offered a five-year membership where you paid $350 in advance, and then you go for five years. It's obviously cheaper at five years to do this option, but three years is our target. So why wouldn't we just go for the five years? And that gets us to risk. There is a risk that if we spent the five-year membership and we go to the gym, that at some point in the future, we may move and we may lose whatever we'd spent for that membership that we hadn't used yet and have to go pay for another membership somewhere else. We might move because we change jobs or things happen with family or whatever it might be. But that is a risk and it's one thing that has to be considered. We can't predict the future, but the more details we can at least estimate and assign probability to, the better decisions we can make as a result. And this brings up the factor of probability and how we use it in our decision-making process. So let's start with one of the most simple examples. Let's say you and a friend of yours are gonna do a coin toss and you're both gonna bet a dollar on whatever the outcome. Option one is the passive approach. You don't bet and you just keep your dollar. Option two is you bet the dollar, but you might receive $2 or you might receive nothing. Since there are only two outcomes with an equal chance of happening, you have a 50-50 shot of getting that $2. Didn't ask for a dime. $2. Cash. <laughs> we can represent this risk by adding a column for probability. And in that column, we'll put 50% as the likelihood of winning the $2. And the average outcome is now $1. So if we do this 100 times, in theory, $1 is your average payout. What that means in terms of option one versus option two now is that in either case, it comes to a $1 at the end of the event. So if we keep the dollar, we still have a dollar. If we bet the dollar, our average return will be a dollar. So objectively, it really doesn't make any difference whether we gamble it or not. Seldom is gambling an even odds proposition. Do you think casino owners wanna just break even? No, of course not. There's a reason casinos are very fancy buildings and the people that run them are rich. What if we buy a Powerball ticket? Is that good use of our money? Let's use casual sense. If we do a quick search just to confirm we have the right facts, the current price of a Powerball ticket is $2. So that's what goes in option one for the passive approach. We basically do nothing. And at the end of this, we still have our $2. According to the website, a $1 million payout is not actually a million dollars in your pocket. There is this thing called taxes and they take a big chunk of it. So on a million dollar win, your payout is actually $665,928. Now that's still a big chunk of money, of course, but you don't wanna just blindly say you're gonna get a million dollars because that's not true. Again, the better information you plug into the decision-making process, the better decisions you get out of it. The published odds of winning the million dollars is one, two, one, one, six, eight, eight, oh, five, three, point, five, two. That's a probability of 0.0000856%. So if we do the same thing we did for the coin toss and we add a probability column with the payout column, after taxes of course, that gives us an average return of 0 0.057 dollars, 5.7 cents. So you're turning your $2 into 5.7 cents, which is an average loss of 97.2%. That's pretty bad. So when it comes to Powerball, listen to Cousin Eddie for advice. Coffee cans in the backyard. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to the channel below. Hit the little bell for notifications to see new videos. Check out the YCC merch store and see if there's anything you like. And let's use casual sense.